Uh, I was uh, reading an article uh, maybe two or three months ago about all the different things that have been COVID related and things that have changed. And uh, I had not really thought about this, even though I had participated in it. There's not a whole lot of people here, but how many of you have built a puzzle in the last year? Just in the last year. Okay, some of us have, some haven't. Uh, but the uh, the demand for puzzles when COVID hit uh, went off the charts. Uh, there's many things this was true with. The demand for uh, broadcasting equipment also. Uh, it, it, every uh, webcam was, was gone for about three months after COVID hit because everybody was trying to figure out how to get on Zoom and all kinds of things. But puzzles, I hadn't thought about this till I saw this article. The demand for puzzles went up 1,000%. <laughs> The biggest puzzle manufacturer in the, uh, in the world, I guess, but the biggest puzzle distributor is Ravensburger. They sold 20 puzzles a minute in May and June. So every minute they sold 20 puzzles. So the, uh, the, that means that every three seconds, just this one company sold a puzzle for two months. Uh, so it's a, we missed a stock investment opportunity, apparently, there. Uh, but uh, Judy and I build puzzles from time to time. We, we enjoy the put, you know, set one out on the dining room table and, and, and fiddle with it here and there and put a piece in now and then. Um, th but there are different kinds of puzzles, as you know. Uh, this is kind of our speed of puzzle. The thousand pieces would be the most pieces. I we're kind of more 500 piece puzzle people. But we like, like this one is a Seattle puzzle. We like the ones that kind of uh, artistically does done. The, uh, this puzzle, if anyone uh, will build it, I'll buy it for them. This is the largest puzzle made or manufactured in the U.S. It has 51,300 pieces. Uh, it's 28 feet wide and six and a half feet tall. So you will have to demonstrate to me you have a place to build it, and then I will get it for you and then uh, bring you food for the next year and a half. Uh, so now some people like puzzles, like we said, we like artistic ones or maybe mountain scenes. Um, this puzzle uh, is one that I would never build unless I was given the choice between building this one or this one. Um, it's, I don't understand people who want puzzles to be more difficult than they are. Uh, my son, uh, Zach, he likes to build puzzles and he will build the puzzle without using the picture. Judy and I, when we build a puzzle, we fight over who can hold the box because if you can't see the picture, how do you have any idea? But he, his, he likes that sort of a challenge. But uh, So if you're not a puzzle person, stick with me here because I'm talking about puzzles for a reason. But when you first get a puzzle, you know, you pull the, the lid off and inside the box it, it looks just like this big mess. And then what do you do? You either just dump it all onto the table and then start to turn all the pieces upright. But what Judy and I have learned to do, at least, for, is we start to look immediately for the edge pieces. And when you're looking in a mess, you can kind of, I don't know exactly where to point because I can't, but my screen's over there, but you, you can even look in the box and see that there are a few edge pieces showing. And, and our approach is to get all of the edge, and, you know, and I think most people do this, build the, the perimeter and then find the easiest places to start. Like maybe there's a little clock tower or something that's very clear, or there's lettering or whatever. And so you find those pieces and you essentially you eliminate the easiest and keep working your way down until all you have left is the, and then you put it away because you're tired of working on it. But the, there's a reason why COVID time, puzzles have become more, not just that we don't have stuff to do. We could play solitaire. Or there's other things. You can paint or draw. And we talked back in the spring about something, some things. But it actually is scientifically proven what puzzles do. And they actually focus the brain. So they assign, for, for people who st st uh, study, struggle, struggle with anxiety, they, it, it seems counterintuitive to me. I would think never give a person with anxiety a puzzle. But what it does is it actually pushes everything else out of your brain because you're focused on a very specific thing. It, it, and try this sometime. If you're going to build a puzzle, try to build a puzzle and think about something else at the same time. It's hard to do because you're looking, your brain is focused on specific things. So it creates a, 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 an organization in your thinking process and it eliminates the ability to kind of have 50 things going on in your head at one time. 
And so that's why they will use these uh, for people who are trying to relax and, and, and learn to focus. Now, if you're in a family that's very anal about how you build a puzzle, don't build puzzles with them. My, my dad uh, was a terror. Uh, he would take stuff apart. If he didn't like how you did it, he would take it apart. And, and so, so I would, when I would get a kid, they'd put a puzzle out, I would build like the blimp that was right in the middle. And then I would set it in the middle and I'd come back and he has taken it apart. And then I'd say, where'd the blimp go? And he would lecture me about it. So don't build puzzles with people like that. But they're very good for focus. Now I'm going to come back to that in a minute. There's a reason why I started with talking about puzzles. Uh, it was not to get you to do one. So, what we are going to take a look at, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you can, you don't have to, because the text I'm going to use is right here on the screen. Uh, similar to puzzles uh, is training for races, and I'll, I'll explain that here in just a minute. Scripture here, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 says, Do you not know that in a race... All the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Now I'll go back to puzzles. This is not how puzzles work. The goal is not to have the last piece. I, there have been, and I think I heard somebody actually here, that, you, yo, I'm going to take that one piece and stick it in my pocket and get to put that last one in. That the... <laughs> did you do that too? No, I didn't even know that was a thing. Oh, yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah, hide the last piece. If you finish and there's like three pieces missing, then you know there's three weasels in the room. They're all trying to do the same thing. But uh, So in a race, unlike really a puzzle, a race is very, very centralized, very focused thing. So if you're thinking in terms of, you read this and go, well, does, does, does this mean that what Paul's trying to say is there's some sort of a competition in the faith? That's not what he's trying to say. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? So he's talking about this event that they're just like in the modern world, they would have races back in ancient times, and people would line up and, and take off and, and run for a, with the goal to get to the finish line. Now, there's different kinds of, of races. We have, like, the, the, the one on the bottom for you would be bottom left, I guess. Uh, so the sprint type race where you line up a handful of people and they're, they're going to run maybe 100 yards or 400 yards or meters if they're in Europe. and uh, Or you have this marathon where you just have everybody packed in together. And in either one, I, I was not a runner when I was younger and, st I mean, and still not, but the, the goal in running is to get to a destination. We have quantified that in terms of making it a, a, a one person gets the prize. And Paul's talking about that, that they're running to get a prize. But what Paul isn't trying to do is say that this is a hardcore competition that has to be done exactly right. What he's trying to get you to think about is the focus it takes to do it well. And so the part about running that I am interested in here is most runners that I know, they are running to create a new personal best as opposed to specifically beating the person on their left and right. My son, when he ran cross country, when he would cross the finish line, what his coach would report is, did you or did you not beat your previous personal best? Did you overcome what you were able to do earlier this time? Now, why that matters to me is what we want to understand and what Paul's trying to get across here is this sense of that I have something I'm trying to accomplish that's the prize. And to get there, and, and to get there is going to take more effort than just I showed up. So the next line, and this is where it might get a little confusing, is Paul, Paul says, whoops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, it says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run? So everybody's participating. Everybody's got a goal to get to the finish line, whatever that is. Now, but only one gets the prize. Is Paul saying, it, let's take the marathon group, that only one in that, in that entire group can be successful? No. That is a, a competition mentality that he's not trying to put in here. What he is trying to put in is this line, run in such a way that you get what you're after that you succeed at what you're doing. So he isn't making faith a competition. 
He isn't setting up a, I need to look at the person on my left and I need to look at my person on my right and I need to make sure that I'm doing better than them. Faith is specifically not that. Our goal is not to compare ourselves with others or to try to outdo others. Our goal is to know what our finish line is, what our goal is, and to get to that goal. This is why Paul's putting into this sort of competition practice is that there or, or setting is that we need to think in terms of there actually is a race going on. There is actually a competition with others? No. A competition with yourself? No. An obstacle to overcome? Yes. There's a destination to get to. What he's wanting to get us to think of in terms of is, I am making forward motion intentionally to accomplish a specific thing. So, he continues on. Yep. I'm still getting used to my new remote. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. People were brought in to compete in the games. They were told ahead of time, you're, it's like we've got the Olympics coming up. They're postponed for a year, but they're, they're theory, theoretically going to happen. So people are being notified, you are in this competition. Then what do you do? So this time I'm actually going to intentionally back up. If you look at the people in the, in the lineup for the sprint, or the, the bigger group, it's harder to see. But imagine if one of those people was there in a lounge chair with sweatpants and a margarita. We would look at it and go, well, somebody didn't realize what they were getting involved in. Somebody is not cognizant that there's an actual product here that we're trying to work towards. That if, 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 you, if somebody was in that picture, it, it actually, I should have done this. I didn't think of it until just this moment. I should have put the Bernie meme in there. Should have had, a, had Bernie Sanders sitting with his stocking cap, and, and, uh, and I've only seen more, like 100,000 of them, so I didn't have enough to choose from. But that, that's exactly what it would be like, is somehow this is out of place. That these people, are their clothes the same? No but they're intentionally chosen. Are their shoes the same? No, but they're intentionally picked. Is the position that they're in one that they just sort of made up on their own? No, this has been refined over time that they know this is, I knew where to be, when to be, what to be wearing, what kind of shape I needed to be in, and I know where I'm going. This is what Paul's trying to get us to think about when we think about our faith. Because faith can very easily become casual. It can become passive. It can become an easy chair with a margarita or whatever you would have in your hand. It can't be that. A pursuit of heaven, we're going to see in a minute, the pursuit of Jesus cannot be passive. It can't be casual. It can't be unthought. And it can't be unpracticed. So, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games, goes into strict training. It, we're not talking about games anymore. We're talking the pursuit of our Savior has some strict training that needs to take place. What does that mean? That's what we've got to figure out. That If, if somebody came to me and said, hey, Dave, in, in, in this summer, in May, you're going to have to run a 400-meter dash in front of a huge crowd that's going to expect you to do something, I would change how I'm going to live. Or I'd quit. I'd start figuring out, how, how do I call in sick? I, I could break my leg. I could, but, but then I'd think, no, I don't want to do anything that hurts me, so okay, I'm going to run in that race. But if I'm going to do it, I'm not going to show up in sweatpants. I'm not going to show up 12 pounds overweight. I'm not going to show up unstretched. I'm going to go online and I'm going to figure out how do I train as a 55-year-old dude to do the very best that I can because it demands my very best. That's what I would do. And I would begin to do my life differently between now and May. This is what Paul's saying. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Look what he says here. They do it to get a crown that will not last. So now he's stepping out of his illustration. He's saying these people that pour everything they've got into doing the very best that they can to get the prize in the race that they're in, they do it to get something that won't last. And he's not criticizing that. 
He's not saying, look at these fools. His point is not them. His point is us. If they're willing to put that much into that thing that's momentary and fleeting, how much more should we be willing to put in to what we consider the most important thing in our lives? And how does he demonstrate that? But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. We have to work backwards from the crown part. We have to think, this is a competition not against anyone else. This is a competition against myself and my flesh that really wants to sit on a beach with a margarita. This is a competition against the me that wants to coast from 55 to however many more years I've got. Is there a piece of me that wants to do that? Yeah. This, uh, I've mentioned uh, maybe by the fire sometime, the, uh, the, this is a fatiguing season. There's a piece of me that would really like to just hook the trailer up to the car and go, let's, let's go. And I'm not saying there aren't times that you can do that. The times that you should do that is in preparation to continue to do this. Everybody needs to take a break and a rest. And, a, and, 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 and if you're training for a race, and so let's say you run 20 laps, you do. You stop and take rests along, periodically, right? Or I ran the 20 laps and then I take a rest. That, this is not saying there is not a time and a season to take a rest or a break. But this is saying it's all part of the strategy. When the football teams, I think this is right, Grant can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when football teams, they will practice for, on a game week, they will practice for a few days and then they will take a day off intentionally so that they're ready on game day. So please don't hear me saying, I'm not, not at all talking about not resting. I'm talking about engaging, being strategic, and thinking how do I manage my life best so that I will get the crown that will last forever. Now we have to hit pause. Can we win, earn the crown that will last forever? No, we can't. We cannot win our way into heaven. We can't perform our way into heaven. We can't train our way into heaven. This is talking in terms of once you are engaged, you're going to get that crown when you die and, and go to heaven, right? You, you, but you didn't earn it. You warranted it, meaning that you invested what needed to be invested. I, someone else paid for it, and I lived up to it. That's what he's talking about here. It's Please, no, no sense of I, I won that crown. Now, get before God and go, look, I, I did this better than anybody else, so you have to let me in. No. What you want to do is be able to stand before the Lord and say, I did this the best that I could so that I could bring honor to you. Pastor Terry, two weeks ago, I believe it was two weeks ago, he's talking in a three-part series about faith. He did a great job in encouraging us towards what it means to step out. And he used the, this reference when, when uh, Peter comes and walks on water, because Jesus walked on the water. You remember him talking about this? You remember certainly the Bible verse, that what, the storm's going on, and the disciples are there, and, and, the, and the boat's going to sink. This isn't the one where Jesus was in the back of the boat. This is when Jesus was walking to get to the boat. And, and they see Jesus, and they think it's a ghost. They go, ah, oh, it's a ghost. And he's like, oh, it's not a, hey, that's kind of a Jesus-y looking ghost. And sure enough, it was Jesus. And then it, Peter says, man, if you're walking on water, if you're really you, tell me that I can do it too. And so Peter, Jesus is like, yeah, no problem. Come on out. And Peter gets out. So, so so we got Jesus right there. He's in this picture. Uh, this was actually a rendition of an older photograph. This one, but uh, so you got Jesus there, and then you got Peter kind of halfway down, right? He he got out of the boat and he was walking towards Jesus. And, and you could look at this picture and go, it, it, no wonder he went down. He's not even looking at Jesus. But that's that was an artistic rendition. But here's my question: Who's this guy? And matter of fact, who are those guys? We know that there's 11 other people in the boat other than Peter, but we don't know who any of them are. I mean, I can sit here and go, okay, well, that was, that was Thomas, and that was Ju clearly Judas is the guy hiding out in the back, probably counting his coins. Who knows? But the point here is with no idea. Even the artist probably, I mean, I don't know who took this picture, but uh, the artist didn't think I'm rendering the other 11 name by name. Why? Because they were nameless. Why? Because they stayed in the boat. Why? Because they were watching somebody else do their faith. And that's the problem. 
I believe one of the classic problems of Christianity is the belief that everyone else is better than me. I can't do what he did. Neither could Peter. They did not have the ability to go, yeah, well, yeah, Peter can walk. Of course, Peter can walk on water. Now, they might have been sitting in the boat going, wow, well, he's dumb enough to try this. I know he's going to sink. I don't know what they were thinking, but here's what they weren't thinking. That's Jesus, and I want to get to him. Peter wasn't thinking, I want him to tell a cool story about me for 2,000 years. What was Peter thinking? I want to get to Jesus. If anybody has the opportunity to get closer to Jesus, I want it to be me that thinks, how do I do that? How do I get out of the boat? You don't hear sermons about the other 11 because they sat in a boat without faith, without desire. They took a passive approach to this one story. I don't want to in any way denigrate the other 11, except right here. All of them were following Jesus, so they've got one up on, on lots of people. But in this story, at this time, they let somebody else do what they should have done. This story should have been about the empty boat, but it wasn't. It's about one guy who stepped out. What's my point? Have we stopped in our own faith life and asked ourselves, am I one of the 11? Or am I the one? Have I said whatever I have to do, if it risks looking foolish, if it risks my time, if it risks my talents that I think I could use in other places, if it, have I done what I have to do to get to Jesus the way that Jesus warrants being gotten to? We read this uh, at the beginning of service, Philippians 3, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. If you look at the red letters here, it says straining. And press, that word press is the same word that would be used to squeeze the juice out of grapes. It's the same word that would be used for two military lines that run into each other and they're pressing forward to gain ground. He's using words here that are actively engaged and focused. What for? The same sort of visual to get the prize that God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. God has called you. It's why you're listening today. It's why you're here today. God has issued a call to your life and said, come. He's walked on the water of the craziness of life just outside of your boat, and he's waiting for you to say, hey, what do I got to do to make that last 10 feet up? You know, I'm not going to go back to the picture, but clearly Jesus was still a little distance from the boat on purpose so that they would have to make the decision, get out of the boat. So that they would have to make the decision, I'm going to let go of this oar that I think is keeping the boat balanced. I'm going to have to not let the person who's sitting between me and Jesus get in my way. I'm going to have to not trust in this boat anymore. Not believe that it, and, and it, could, could it have saved them? Maybe, but would they have gotten the prize? No. Only Peter did. Because he got out. And I hope that you're not hearing this going, that Dave's adding on to what Terry said. What Terry said was absolutely true. I want to focus now back to those other 11 and make sure none of us are in the boat. To make sure none of us are thinking that faith is passive and casual. American church practice is passive and casual. It can very easily be country clubbish. I stop in every couple of Sundays get a donut and a coffee and listen to a good message. No. The practice of religion is not the pursuit of Jesus. There are religious practices in the pursuit of Jesus. But attending church 
If you're not attending a living, connected community that's actively getting out of the boat together, then they're in danger of the country club church. It's not our church. I don't believe that. But you can be a part of this church and still be passive. I started off talking about puzzles and how Judy and I do puzzles, and we look for the edge pieces. The last puzzle that we got out, maybe, I don't know, six, eight weeks ago, we got the puzzle out, and it was sitting, and just the top had been off, and I was like, oh, well, it's, I might as well get started. And so instead of the normal practice of just dumping the pieces out and then sliding everything off to the sides and, and keeping the edge pieces, I decided, because we always miss edge pieces, I decided I'm going to do this organized. I'm going to do one piece at a time. It was, I think, a 500-piece puzzle, and I'm just gonna so I can get all the edge pieces the first time because I can't stand. Oh, we got all but one, and I got 434 pieces. I got to go back through and go, where is it? And if I'm doing a thousand-piece puzzle, it's I don't know the math, but so I decided one at a time, just going one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. Here's an edge piece, set it on the table, put it one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And when I got done and I put the edge together, it was missing five. And it taught me something. It's hard to stay focused. I actually thought I was looking at every single one of them and keeping out the edge ones, and I physically handled every single one of them and took five edge pieces and put them back because I lost focus. So then Judy went through, and, cause she, and, they were all, and, and, and she found two of them. She didn't do it the way that I did it, so I'm like, well, all right. As a personal punishment, penance. I'm not Catholic, but I thought I got to go. I'm going to do it again, and I'm going through one at a time. And I tossed a piece in. I don't know if this was God or just m m me, but and I looked down, and there was an edge piece that I just threw in the box of non-edge pieces again because I lost focus. It's hard to stay focused. It's hard to keep my eyes on the prize all the time. I need reminders. I need other people. I need intentionalization. I need a finish line. And then I need to know, how do I do this well? And you know who can help with that? The community. Yeah, I, that didn't work well for me either. But this did. Yeah, I got stuck there too. Let me help you out of that. This, that is a challenge. Let's do this one together. That's what the community of Jesus is for. So when you start looking for those puzzle pieces and you start, and you miss it, you can go back and get it. We need focus. Now this is what Scripture says. If any of you lacks, lacks wisdom, you should ask God, and, there, and then it, the little piece I took out isn't the answer is, and it will be given to you. Here's why I have this verse and the next one I'm going to show you in a minute. I'm going to ask you to do something. We've got a new year ahead of us. It's just at the end of January. We've got 11 months. Don't have any idea what's coming. Is COVID going to get worse? Going to get better? Are we going to be able to do church? Are we not? We're working on all of these things. And in the midst of all of these things, I think that there's the, the danger that we have become boat bound. So I'm going to ask you to ask the Lord, because that's not my job to tell you if you're boat bound. Ask Him, how am I doing? Am I running after you, Lord, as though you're the prize? Am I training in such a way that this is evidently what matters to me? So ask Him. Lord, what do I need to do next? How do I train? How do I get out of the boat? How do I have more faith? How do I trust you more? What issues are in my way? And here's what Jesus said. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. He promises he will tell you. In James, he says, if you ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you. And Jesus said, if you're talking with me, if you're listening for me, I will lead you. And so where I am asking us to start this year is with this question. Am I pursuing you, Jesus, the way you deserve to be pursued?
Am I straining? Am I pressing so that I can win? Now, please don't hear that wrong. There's no competition. There's no judgment. There's desire. There's intensity. There's focus. Only you know whether you are pressing forward. I like that he has said here, forgetting what is behind. What's behind is meaningless at this point. If your past is full of sin, if your past is full of passivity, if your past is full of religiosity, if your past is glorious, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. You can't live on your old past, you can't be hindered by your old past. Leave it. Fix your eyes on Jesus and ask him the question, how do I get to you? I asked earlier in family business for you to go, if you haven't watched the By the Fire for this week, to do that. Here's why I asked for that. Because I believe that God is asking us to evaluate how we're pursuing our faith, individually and corporately. Are we pressing on? And are we bringing others with us? Those are the questions. Am I pressing to my Savior? And am I pulling others with me? Because that's the kingdom. And that's what I believe God's calling us to this year. So do me the favor. Take some time. Set some time aside. Use your closet. Use your wherever it is that you talk with the Lord and say, Lord, I need wisdom. How do I do this? Lord, I know you'll lead me if I'll listen. And I am now listening. And if you tell me, I'll do it. Let's pursue him with everything we have. So when we get before him, we know we've laid it all out. There's nothing left behind. Amen?